Hello and welcome to the Ori Spotlight podcast. This week, we're lucky enough to have Jeff and Adam from LEK Consulting. Jeff Holder and Adam Siebert uh, head up their uh, life sciences slash LNG therapy practices. Uh, and most of you know who LEK Consulting is, but I thought we might just start there with uh, a little bit more about each of you, how you got uh, to this point in your careers, uh, and what you guys are up to at LEK that's uh, relevant for Shell and Gene. Should we start with Adam? Sure, happy to. Um, first, thanks for having us, Jason. Um, so as Jason indicated, I am a partner in LEK Consulting within our life sciences enablers practice, and we'll We'll get into that in a bit more detail as we go through the conversation. But uh, I started my career as a as a scientist, as a cell biologist, uh, and really at my my path to that was a little bit more winding. I did not necessarily know exactly what I wanted to do, and so I started off first working for a pharma company and realized that all the people that had interesting jobs had more initials after their names. So I knew I needed to go back to school for something and. Uh, science has always been something that made sense to me and, and, and was something that I was interested and passionate in. And so decided to go back to school for a PhD in cell biology and knowing full well that I never wanted to stay within academic research uh, as a career choice. So as soon as I started in grad school, I was already looking for other perhaps non-traditional career paths and, and consulting was one that I felt kept the most doors open uh, as, as I think about kind of the, the overall trajectory and pathway to a career. So that's what I, I really pursued as uh, towards the latter part of my uh, graduate school training and was fortunate enough to get an offer from LEK. Uh, so I spent the last 10 years working within their life sciences practice, first within kind of the biopharma side of things, helping biopharma companies think about their R&D portfolios and strategies, as well as their corporate strategies. Uh, But within the last five years, transitioned over to what we call the life sciences enablers, which colloquially we think of as anything that a biopharma company buys. That's kind of what we work in. Uh, And so the the major areas there are uh, life science research tools, diagnostics and precision medicine, biopharma manufacturing and supply chain, and then overall pharma services. And I spend most of my time within the, the biopharma manufacturing supply chain with a pretty big emphasis in um, the advanced therapeutic modalities. So cell therapies, gene therapies, nucleic acid medicines, um, and then also into some of the more advanced biologics with bispecifics, ADCs, radiopharmaceuticals, et cetera. So that's kind of where I spend a lot of my time, um, really passionate in, in about how we make these innovative and novel therapies more accessible and you know, there's a lot of the conversation later today that we're going to get into about making, you know, reducing COGS, making a more streamlined process, et cetera, that I think are, are you know, essential for how we think about this industry going forward. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I wouldn't say it's that non-traditional for people to go into a PhD and figure out about halfway through that they don't want to be in the lab for the rest of their lives. So I think that's... Yeah, I think increasingly that's the case. And it's a... It's a good pathway and a good, I guess, direction that we're heading in um, just because it's not feasible to stay within academia. So, yeah. Yeah. It's important to have that scientific training and rigor in the business world, particularly in biopharma. So, and I loved you calling it enabling technologies. Um, you know, everyone says, oh, you're a tools business. I'm like, no, no, no. We're, we're an enabling technologies business. It's a, t- it's a totally different thing. <laughs> it used to be that tools like, oh, tools, you know, it's not therapeutics, it's tools. Uh, but as we've learned in uh, advanced therapies in particular, these uh, these platforms are, t- are taking on greater and greater importance uh, as we move forward to commercialization, which we'll talk a lot more about. Um, can you tell us a bit more about LEK? I mean, most people know uh, know you guys, but it'd probably be worthwhile just describing the firm a little bit before we get down to the details. Sure. So LEK is a global strategy management consulting firm. Um, we started 40 years ago uh, as a spin out from Bain in London. Um, and obviously over the past 40 years, we've grown quite a bit. Uh, I think we have, you know, over 2000 folks on staff, over 200 partners as well. Um, and this spans all industries and sectors. So we are a, a generalist firm. That being said, healthcare with a capital H is kind of our biggest sector. Um, and, and within that, it, it again spans a variety of stuff, right? We have healthcare services, um, payer provider. 
we have med tech and then life sciences. And, and as I alluded to in my initial question or answer, the life sciences biopharma is really helping biopharma companies, you know, think through their strategies over a broad portfolio of, of, of areas, right? In terms of either corporate strategy, R&D, uh, uh, you know, portfolio uh, strategies, um, go to market strategies, et cetera. Um, and then what Jeff and I do, which is the enablers. Um, and, and so we are tackling some of the same strategic issues across the different sectors and, and companies. It's just in my own vernacular, it's asking the same questions just with a different vocabulary, right? We're not necessarily thinking about, you know, what's the best, you know, which drug program should we be taking forward? It's instead, you know, which use case for our novel technology should we be prioritizing and, and should we really be thinking about, um, you know, how to take that to market and who to go after? Um, so, so it's, again, similar questions, just different vocabulary. Uh, within the life sciences enablers, uh, we do have uh, four other partners that are um, leading it. Uh, Alex Vadas and Zhang are the, the are senior partners that have really built this uh, practice up from the ground. Um, and then Tian Han and, and Matt Wheeler as well um, are, are the other two partners that are, are within this practice. We also do have a staff of about 50 to 60 um, consulting professionals that support us, um, and they are dedicated to this space. So as, as much passion as Jeff and I have for this area, I would say that the that our colleagues who are working on these projects within the consulting staff they share that same passion and energy, um, which really helps out a lot as as we think about the complexities within the space um, that they can really hit the ground running and, and already have a, an incoming knowledge base uh, that that they can build off of uh, to really you know get to the implications and insights sooner than later uh, for the projects. Well, that's great background on LEK as well. And, you know, maybe you can, we can start off if you don't mind, um, just giving us a, a flavor of the kinds of projects that you guys get called into, you know, what types of clients, you know, I'm guessing biopharma is a big customer, I'm guessing some of the CDMOs, potentially other service providers, other technology companies, like give me a sense of some of the the kinds of challenges that your clients are engaging you with and that you guys are thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so I would say that we have at the highest level, we have the transaction support that we're supporting either private equity clients or even, you know, uh, more industry clients with or strategic clients with capital raises or divestitures or M&A activity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we support both the buy side and the sell side on those those types of projects. But then on the I guess on the strategic side. With actual, you know, biopharma customers or the tools and, and aggregators parts of the business, we do support the major aggregators, the Danaher's, Thermos of the world. We also get into kind of the emerging or, or tools players, or I know we we said tools earlier as more. Yeah, we banned the tools from this podcast. Sorry, can't, yeah, can't use that. that's right. Um, <laughs> the but, enabling technology, players. you know, well, innovative or enabling technologies. That's right. Um, that that supply into the workflows for. Um, cell and gene therapies or other modalities. Uh, we also, you know, help equipment manufacturers, again, that are supplying into this space. And then from a manufacturing standpoint, we do support both CDMOs or CTDMOs, depending on, uh, you know, how deep into the, the world of contract services we want to go. And then also biopharma on the CMC and manufacturing organization and quality organization. We're doing a, a lot of projects right now helping biopharma companies think through their manufacturing strategies, right? What are they producing? Are they doing it in-house? Are they outsourcing it? What parts are they outsourcing? With whom are they partnering for that activity? Um, and really, and I guess the second piece of that is, given that there's a lot of biopharma companies that have their own internal manufacturing facility, what should we do with that internal manufacturing facility, All right? There's been, at least over the past you know, year to years, there's been a lot of holds or, or delays in, in pro, uh, biopharma program development programs, some clinical uh, failures as well. And so a lot of companies have a large fixed cost on their hands when it comes to a manufacturing facility and they want to know what we, what they should be doing with it. Um, so there's a lot of strategic 
options and, and discussions around the value of that facility, and especially as it, you know, when we compare to outsourcing to a CDMO right now. I was going to say you're seeing the they're seeing the lines blur a bit as well. So we saw Novartis contract with J and J Legends, you know, on Carvicti Manufacturing. They had some capacity in there. I think it was a Morris Plains facility. So they're not only manufacturing their own products, but also acting as a as CDMO for for other partners. It was kind of an interesting strategic shift, I think, for a lot of the big pharma players. Yeah, it's an interesting shift. There's a lot of complexity around that, right? There's a lot of complexity in terms of the walls between the internal and the external programs and the sharing of IP. There's mm-hmm. a lot of discussion around the suitability of a biopharma manufacturing facility to then transition to being a CDMO facility that can take on, you know, the complexity of not only multiple programs, but also, you know, the, the needs of each program are going to be very, very different. And so how sure. quickly can we turn around a suite and how universal is a suite um, for a variety of different programs that may be quite different from each other? Um, yeah. I think the other piece that that is really challenging is how do we fill that that capacity? Right, because it, it takes a long time for an asset to to move through to later clinical stages or even commercial, where where really the demand is going to be significant. And so, how how do we get the earlier stage assets into the facility, and how do we compete against the more established CDMOs that may already have a track record here? Um, mm-hmm. So it's a it's a very complex question uh, on how do we fill it and and. I think a lot of people are still trying to figure this out as 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 we go. Jeff, love to give you a chance to just introduce your your background a little bit, and then want to invite you into this conversation around you know it's kind of heading into this buyer build discussion. I think there's been, you know, we've seen a lot of companies maybe four or five years ago want to build out and own their own capacity, um, and I can name six or seven of them that have some subsequently you know once they built that capacity out, taken it and then sold it on. Because they realized actually, you know, utilizing that capacity is a totally different game than what they're used to in, in drug development. Um, so if you don't mind, just give me a, a, a quick intro on yourself. And then if you care to weigh in on that topic, this kind of buyer build decision that's facing a lot of early stage selling gene therapy companies. Sure, absolutely. Jeff Holder, I'm a partner and managing director at LEK based at the San Francisco office. Uh, much like Adam, my my path to consulting was was far from a straight line. It was, a bit of a random walk, if I'm being honest. Never had a laser-focused idea of what I wanted to do with my career. Was always interested in uh, medicine and technology and innovation in medicine. Uh, I come from a family of doctors and nurses, but uh, I wasn't really cut out for medical school. I cannot stand the sight of blood, so that was never really in the cards for me. Uh, I studied chemistry uh, in college because I liked the idea of building things and, and putting molecules together. Kind of probably grew out of my interest in Legos as a, ch- as a kid. Uh, and I, so I came to really appreciate the challenge of drug discovery through the, the small molecule lens, through my, through my coursework, through industry uh, interactions at conferences, did an internship in Eli Lilly as a medicinal chemist. And I became to just really think about those bigger picture questions about how do we pick targets how do we address undruggable targets? What do we do in indications where we don't have drugs today? How do we think about portfolio strategy? Kind of came to appreciate that these were these big strategic questions uh, that I wanted to wrestle with with the career. And I didn't really have any idea how to do that uh, in a traditional uh, academic path or in a traditional uh, go work at, uh, as a research scientist path. So I had a friend uh, from graduate school who was at this firm called LEK Consulting at the time. She told me, that her job was interviewing world-leading KOLs and thinking about cutting-edge topics and helping advise innovative companies on growth strategies. And I thought that sounded amazing, but I didn't know the first thing about business mm. as, a, as, as somebody very grounded in uh, science and chemistry. So I started you know, reading up on uh, Harvard Business Review articles, books, practice case interviews, joined the consulting club, all of that. And with a lot of uh, practice, I was fortunate enough to, to get an offer here at LEK and um, my path here has been, been a confluence of both my interest vectors in precision medicine, uh, innovative science, making drugs, the ecosystem of enabling technologies and processes and services around drugs, uh, and a little bit of the right time and right place that when I started was really the explosion of the cell and gene therapy space. I had the great fortune to work on some landmark M&A and business development deals 
uh, during my early years and, and, and really snowballed that into an area of expertise and, uh, and, and a career vector. So uh, really fortunate to be uh, as deep in the space as, as we have the opportunity to be today with our exposure and uh, the projects and clients that we support. That's great. Thanks for that background. And Adam had covered a bit about the, the, the types of clients and work that you guys are doing. I wonder if you could weigh, on, weigh in on this discussion about, I know, you know, many people, certainly many companies as they hit closer to commercialization want to be in control of their own manufacturing uh, capacity. Uh, but it's a long and torturous road, as we know, to commercialization. And I wonder kind of what the current thinking is around this buyer build. And we were at the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine meeting uh, early October, I think it was, out in Carlsbad. And there was something like 43 cell and gene therapy CDMOs there. I mean, it was an explosion of that kind of that part of the market and the service providers there, uh, which signals to me that, you know, this kind of these service providers are seeing an, an opportunity that, you know, maybe companies don't want to own uh, their own capacity or build their own capacity out as early as they might have done four or five years ago. But I don't know if that's an accurate reading of the situation or what your view is. Yeah, thanks, Jason. It's a really good question. And I do think that the dynamic has changed over the past four or five years, certainly over the last two years, as the funding environment and the macroeconomic environment has changed. Let's, let's take ourselves back five, six years ago. There's a lot more white space in the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a, the dynamic was speed, speed really at all costs to get to market, to get through clinical trials first particularly in uh, prevalence-driven indications, there was this view that uh, not only does first mover convey a significant advantage, but potentially first takes most. If you are treating and removing addressable patients from that prevalent pool, uh, in, 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 for example, in rare monogenic diseases for viral mm-hmm. vector gene therapy, there was very much a first takes most attitude. And that dynamic drove speed at all costs as the development goal. So we were taking effectively academic processes, trying to commercialize them, trying to get them uh, into into patients as fast as possible. So there was tremendous strategic value in owning your own capacity and and really controlling your destiny from a clinical timeline perspective. Mm -hmm. Again, remember, there weren't that many CDMOs uh, five, six years ago either that could really say with a straight face that they had supported a GMP process or a clinical trial, let alone any sort of regulatory approval. And those players had an 18 plus month wait for a suite. Uh, so there was a significant amount of getting in line very early, and there was a significant amount of, uh, for the players who had access to capital, the decision to build, to control their own destinies. And strategic insourcing of supply uh, was, was a big piece of controlling that clinical destiny. Mm. So I think that was the scenario five, six years ago. Now, there's kind of two trends that I, that I see. W- w- one is more recognition. Uh, of of the value of thinking through manufacturing and, and, and developing a more robust, uh, scalable, if you will, or commercially viable manufacturing process. So we like to talk a lot about the GMPification of the preclinical space and, and, and kind of drifting earlier in the value chain to these considerations of process and scale and, and cost efficiency and, and COGS. Uh, so there's, there's that on one hand, uh, as, as, as a push or a pull, and then uh, the access to capital and the funding situation is, is materially different. Uh, it's much harder to raise money. It's much harder to uh, to, to justify the capital expenditure of, of a facilities build out, particularly if you're uh, ahead of any meaningful proof of concept clinical data. That's a mm-hmm. big risk for for a small company to take that on. But we saw plenty of companies do that five, four or five years ago. Mm-hmm. Not the case anymore. So I think those are the, the push and pull dynamics that are that are uh, are, are changing the, the the buyer build dynamic, and then there's a bigger question. I'll, I'll kick this one to Adam about uh, the, the role of the CDMO, and uh, obviously there's been there's been some uh, we can call it less than favorable headlines for some CDMOs, a lot of uh, four and four eighty threes being being thrown around, uh, uh, and and some some pretty high profile um, missteps. By some CDMOs and, and CRO partners uh, in, in, in the advanced modality space, so there's a push and a pull of, of these 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 cost factors of the who do you trust, who can you rely on and depend on? Uh, are we the right people? Is a CDMO or a CRO partner the right uh, uh, person or partner for the job? Mm-hmm. Uh, so so it's a, it's become a complicated question uh, as as the, the field matures and we we think more about being commercially ready. 
but also not having uh, kind of that, that that access to capital that would really allow us to to, to build. So it becomes much more of a how uh, how how to partner and 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 what's the right way to think about getting to the market with something that is a viable process that's going to allow a viable business case for your for your company or your asset. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that long ago that people were paying a million bucks for a slot a couple of years in the future to try and get, guarantee themselves a, a development or manufacturing slot uh, that. I'm guessing that uh, that kind of thing is a is an antiquated uh, um, activity from a couple of years ago. But Adam, interested in your view? I, I think that's right for today, right? I, I, the shift from pure capacity is a differentiator for a CDMO to now being experienced capacity is now the, yeah. the true thing, right? I mean, we've talked. I know Jeff and I have talked historically, and it's a pervading theme or prevailing theme. Um, you know, across all of the the advanced therapies conferences about the expertise, right? And 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 it's not just about getting people; it's about getting the right people who know what they're doing, and yeah. that's certainly still at a premium. And it's one of the biggest challenges that we have as we think about transitioning to a CDMO versus keeping the manufacturing process inside. You know, internal is. You know, we know our process. We can, we think we can scale it versus once you do the tech transfer, there's always going to be hurdles with the tech transfer. And then you're inherently going to have to trust other people to, to do it for you. So I, I do think that that is a, a chief concern. Um, as we think about, you know, transferring over to a CDMO. I think the other thing is as we think about the scaling and filling the facilities for internal manufacturing. A lot of the companies right now, you know, it's it's either preclinical or early clinical stages, but you need to build a facility that is going to be able to accommodate late clinical or commercial batches and commercial scale. And so that inherently means that you're going to need a larger facility to be able to handle that. And it puts a large fixed cost, again, I, I think we mentioned it earlier, but if on these more or less smaller biopharma companies and being able to, um, I guess, handle those costs in the near term when the, the plant is operating at suboptimal efficiencies is a real struggle for, for these companies. So somehow developing a modular manufacturing uh, uh, facility that, that you can expand into as, as needed is, is really the, the, the secret weapon here. I just don't know that I've seen a lot of that, at least to date. Yeah, no, a couple of points there I wanted to highlight. So, you know, as an enabling technology platform for manufacturing, obviously we're trying to close and automate, you know, cell therapy manufacturing. And we've partnered with people like GCon and Germfree who in the modular clean room space to, to essentially offer a, a turnkey, you know, modular manufacturing footprint. And our hope is that that will help in this, in this discussion to say, actually, maybe we could lease that space or maybe we could buy it. We wouldn't have to buy you know, 100,000 square feet, you buy 1,000 square feet, and then you can kind of scale as you go or get scale as you reach your clinical milestones or raise your additional round or whatever it is and give kind of de-risk that manufacturing investment decision as you get more and more proof points, be they clinical or commercial proof points. Um, you know, we've seen many of the of the cell therapy products when they launch, you know, they start out at relatively modest volumes, a couple hundred patients in the first couple of years, and then kind of moving into the thousands, but it's not, you know, immediately you're trying to produce 10,000 doses. So this stepwise approach, not building out your capacity too far because unused capacity is expensive, uh, very expensive to operate and very expensive to build. So that's, that's certainly a consideration. The other thing you mentioned, which I think is critical to highlight is, you know, therapy developers are looking for the right partner or partners to help them hit that next milestone, get into the clinic or get those clinical proof points, whatever it is. And our philosophy has always been to give them as much flexibility as possible. We don't want to close doors for them or lock them into certain things that they don't want to do or they don't want to, that's not their direction of travel. Um, and in the past, you know, technology providers haven't been that flexible. It's sort of, here's the system, here's how it works, you know, take it or leave it, you know, <laughs> let us know if you have any problems. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time focused on flexibility on how do we demonstrate the platform's capability in R&D or preclinical or, you know, potentially in the clinical trial setting or across cell types. You know, we've done work in CAR-T and TIL and TCR and MK, 
dendritic cell, CD34, like a whole bunch of different cell types that might encompass a larger part of your development portfolio, your, you know, your pipeline to say, you don't want to spend a lot of time and a lot of money on a platform that's only going to work for a single program or only going to work for the next three years. And then I have to leave that platform to get to scale. These are the challenges that today uh, are facing the industry. Uh, And, you know, when you combine that with a service offering, potentially, you know, you want not only best of breed technology as a therapy developer, you want to go with the people who have the knowledge and expertise. You know, this is what you said, Adam, which I think is 100% right. Um, And going to, you know, those people that are experts like, uh, you know, CTMC or like, uh, you know, Charles River Elevate or some of these other guys who really know deeply about cell therapy manufacturing, they want to be able to leverage the best, best in class, you know, whether it be services or technology. And by locking them out of that and, and forcing them to try, you know, either untested technology or service providers who don't have that depth of expertise, it's just cutting off their options. And so we've really tried to maintain flexibility, partner widely, lots of organizations. Uh, and we're thinking about a model called manufacturing the service, effectively well, in, installing our platform in lots of different types of, of settings. So it might be an academic setting, or maybe it's like the cell and gene therapy catapult here in the UK. Maybe it's a CDMO partner site in the US and allowing people to kind of transfer between those settings as their needs evolve. You know, if I need PD or R and D, I might go to a specialist, you know, CDMO to help me with that. Or if I want clinical manufacturing, maybe I'll go to MD Anderson and maybe they'll help me with that because that, you know, I want to be close to the patients or, you know, there's other ways to think about it. So flexibility is such an important point, retaining flexibility uh, because we don't really know. We don't know what challenges are going to come around the next month, the next, you know, next year and locking yourself off from those opportunities can be costly. You know, as we've seen, you know, if you, if you put a hundred million dollars in the ground into a facility, that's a certain footprint, a certain design, certain set of capabilities in a certain location, three years before you get regulatory approval, you're severely limiting your options. I mean, and we've seen that really come back to bite in several companies. Um, and so, you know, really just kind of highlighting that flexibility point, absolutely critical. Jeff, I wanted to come to you on the next question, just to say we're, we're, at, we're at the end of 2023 uh, and it's been a big year. Uh, for cell therapy. I think now we've had eight approvals. We had a couple very recently um, in the sickle cell space, both Bluebird and, and Vertex CRISPR got approvals recently. And there's you know several thousand clinical trials happening currently. Uh, when you reflect back on 2023 for, for the cell and gene therapy industry, what do you see? You know, what, what were your biggest takeaways uh, from the last uh, 12 months? Yeah, great question, Jason. Uh, really worth looking back. I think 2023 will be look back upon as a, as a, as a meaningful inflection point for this space. It was a very big year from an approval standpoint. And I really think it started to shift some of the questions that both patients and investors and developers are asking about the space where we've kind of evolved from scientific and regulatory proof points, you know, questions like, uh, what's your, what are your efficacy data? Can you actually get a regulatory approval in that indication to questions around commercial viability of, of, of the business case for, for the system, for patients, for, for, for the healthcare uh, uh, system. Can we afford this? Why should I take this instead of a standard of fair therapy? How much should we pay for these drugs? How long do they last? What's the, you know, basically more, more around the, the commercial side of the question. So uh, I think it's important to, to, to look back and take stock and, and, and be proud of the, the scientific advances and, and the number of regulatory approvals we've been able to get. Uh, particularly in a, in a in a tough macroeconomic climate, so at the at the end of the day, we can we can look back and say a lot of the scientific promise has come to fruition. But the industry is now increasingly turning its eyes toward economics and and, and commercial viability and, and making a business case and, and seeing are are there going to be other other billion dollar franchises out there? Uh, in, in viral vector gene therapy, we've we've got Zolgensma as a in the AAV space as a, as, as a billion dollar franchise, I believe yes, Carta from, from Kite crossed that line earlier this year uh, in CAR T therapies with their uh, second line approval in large B cell lymphomas last year as a main driver there. So I think uh, I think the industry is kind of looking for for evidence of uh, is there going to be another billion dollar asset in the cell and gene space? Who's it going to be? I uh, can contrast that to uh, someone like Bluebird, who does have, I think now it's a 
four, I believe, globally approved approved drugs. But the market cap doesn't look anything like you would expect for a company with four approved drugs in, in the cell and gene therapy space. So, so that's kind of a critical question and, and a major inflection point that 2023 was, was it used to be regulatory approval it was, was kind of the goal. There was a little bit of a build it and they will come mentality, but now we're starting to realize that the space is going to have to uh, uh, drive access, drive reimbursement, drive patient uptake, just like any other uh, 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 biotech uh, asset or, or, or company would have to think about it. But it's more complicated because these are uh, uh, obviously harder to make, more complicated uh, uh, and more sophisticated uh, biologic biologic drugs that are using mechanisms of action that are novel and are going to require uh, some, some 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 coaching and some teaching and market development and bringing providers and patients along on the journey about why these are uh, uh, good solutions. So that's kind of an overarching question or, or, or thought about the space. Um, I think in cell therapy specifically, when you think about the state of play, many approved uh, autologous uh, CAR T therapeutics. We're looking still in, in hematologic cancer, still CD19 or BCMA uh, is, is kind of the state of play on the commercial market. Uh, so I think in the, the, the open questions and, and, and uh, kind of where I see interest and in, in, in direction of travel for this space, uh, big questions, how do we minimize vein to vein time? How do we keep our, uh, our, our costs down so that as we climb lines of therapy, we can compete with a maturing pipeline of out-of-class competition. A lot of interest in the bispecific antibody world. Uh, Radio pharmaceuticals, ADCs, have been white hot this year. Uh, so, so uh, a growing list of alternatives and out-of-class non-cell therapy com- competition uh, as we climb lines of therapy and are trying to, to treat patients earlier and earlier. And then, how do we move beyond heme? I think moving beyond heme, uh, two directions of travel there. One into solid tumor, uh, again, major area of interest, more than 90% of cancer incidence is solid tumor, so much larger market opportunity, many more patients with, with significant unmet medical need in that space. Haven't really seen a silver bullet there, but a lot of great ideas and interesting approaches in the clinic. And the other major direction of travel is, is really orthogonal to oncology, and I would say into uh, either autoimmune more broadly uh, as we recognize the role of, of, of B cells in things like uh, uh, lupus, has uh, is, is been a, is been a pretty interesting early success story from some of the data, and other companies looking more broadly, things like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, and even into regenerative medicine, things like type one diabetes from Vertex, Parkinson's from Blue Rock, kind of another frontier for cell therapy. Uh, and then the third question, so you've kind of got how do we, with what we have, how do we minimize the cost and vein to vein time and heme? How do we move beyond heme into either solid tumor or beyond oncology into regenerative medicine more broadly? And then third, how do we move or can we move beyond the autologous approach? Uh, it's a really high bar from a safety and, and you know, certainly an efficacy and durability of response standpoint. Got, you know, the, the, the Emily Whitehead story with over a decade of, of, of remission. So the, the data are the bar is quite high, but obviously the interest in analogeneic, both from a from a cost and uh, manufacturing efficiency standpoint, and uh, even into these kind of in vivo uh, cell engineering approaches, uh, is something that has been been interesting this year to look at. So those are kind of the three big questions, and uh, in terms of where the where the field goes from there, and, and what's being investigated in terms of areas of investigation for. Uh, investment or, or areas of interest from the investor community and the developers we talk to, uh, the, the design aspect of cell therapy. So the different cell types, different engineering approaches uh, to try to address the uh, tumor heterogeneity, overcome immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, improve cell infiltration into tissue. So all of that kind of uh, what we'll call therapeutic design ethos is is still a major major investment theme and major area of interest. As uh, said earlier, no real silver bullet identified yet. I think one thing that's really important to call out is is kind of do we move beyond viral transduction as the way that we engineer T cells or or cells for therapy writ large? Uh, I think two two interesting developments more recently here that could be drivers. Obviously, the uh, the, the major approval uh, for for, uh, for for vertex and CRISPR therapeutics in the uh, uh, in the SCD space. Uh, so, so using CRISPR edited therapies, so that's a huge huge approval milestone. Uh, and set some regulatory precedent for for non-viral engineering in, in an FDA-approved drug. The other side of the coin, you know, that's the, that's the carrot. The stick could be that the, the recently announced FDA investigation into T cell malignancies and some of the early uh, CAR T products. 
Uh, so, so you can you can make the case that that's probably an outgrowth of uh, 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 maybe some some viral integration into a oncogenic gene driving some sort of uh, uh, malignancy. So, being able to control where and how we integrate into the genome and how uh, the edits take place uh, could become a more important theme. So, I think that moving beyond viral transduction is the third as the second theme. So, cell design moving beyond viral transduction. And then third, uh, it will it will always be how do we reduce vein to vein time and reduce cogs? Uh, I think trying to reduce labor and risk of contamination, minimize unit operations by kind of boxing up uh, more or or all as you guys are doing of, of 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 the workflow. Obviously, trying to streamline the process and minimize remanufacturing, reduce patient waiting, improve the robustness of these processes, and ultimately we want to make these therapies cheaper, more affordable, so that we can unlock all the indications. Uh, with the patients who need these innovations uh, and, and make them all commercially viable so that there's a reason for, for a company to go and, and develop a drug uh, for all these patients in need. Yeah, we can spend the rest of the podcast on picking that answer. There's so many golden nuggets in there. <laughs> I wanted, I want to hone in on, you just reiterated, which is great, the commercial viability question. You know, I think when we grew up, in those of us that grew up in small molecules and biologics, market access and manufacturing was basically assumed. It was sort of, a given, you know, if you can make a product that's clinically effective, you'll be able to manufacture it and it will get covered. You know, maybe it might be third line and second, second line, or maybe it might be, you know, rather than preferred access on the formulary, it might not be, it could be non-preferred, but they're going to pay for it. And I think, you know, that sort of approach has carried us through the early phases of advanced therapy thinking around market access and commercialization now, we wouldn't we wouldn't be worrying about things like you know how are we going to make these things how are we going to how are we going to get to market until phase three and you might be thinking about your market access strategy and you know how are we going to contract and those kinds of things but you mentioned something really interesting um, which I'm going to ask Adam to comment on which is manufacturers of advanced therapies have to be thinking about CMC from preclinical from early stage R and D. I got to be thinking, how am I going to make a product that has, you know, meets my target cost of goods? Because I actually, in my old TPP in the small molecule world, I wouldn't even have had a cost of goods. It wouldn't even have been a consideration in my target product profile. But now I got to be thinking, how much is that this thing going to cost to make? What's my target indication? How many patients am I intending to treat in a given year? How am I going to make the product to, to suit the needs of those patient populations? And I have to do it all before I know, you know, before I'm in, you know, first in human, first in man, whether it works or not. Because otherwise, if I wait too long, if I wait post phase one, two, then I'm stuffed. It's too late to fix it. Um, And this is the problem that we've seen. And my biggest fear about some of the upcoming approvals, which we'll talk about in a minute, that we might see more of these products that are incredibly clinically effective, but we just can't make them, can't get them to patients. Adam, I'd love to hear your view on that. It's something that's a recurring theme and something that we hear about a lot, right? Where we say, oh, this product has a really old process and it's really expensive and just not efficient at all. There's not a straight path forward for it. But man, is it, it is really, really effective, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so I do think that people are becoming more sophisticated, are starting to think a bit more, um, having more forethought to getting to an industrialized, process sooner than later, right? It's it's certainly in the cards for them. It's just taking some time. I also think that for this, for upcoming waves of technologies, that there is the potential to, to go back to the original process for some of these products and redo them, right? I mean, there is a financial a business case to be made for, for this, for sure, right? If, if you're going to knock down your cost of goods by I don't know, 10 X, which, you know, seems exorbitant, but Mm -hmm. certainly there's potential for that, depending on the technologies. That's certainly something that you can make the case that this is a worthwhile investment and you're going to recoup those costs because it's not just about you're going to improve your profit margins in the long term, but really, I think in our eyes, by reducing the cogs, you're unlocking swaths of the patient population that can now have access to this. Right. It's, it's not just from a market access, but then also you can move from, I don't know, academic medical centers to community settings. And, and it just things will unlock. And you're also going to move from niche orphan diseases to 
perhaps more common ones. Um, but you need to unlock those the, the cog savings in order to yeah. do that. As an aside, I mean, I heard uh, the CEO of Legend uh, Biotech present at Jeffrey's a month or so ago, and he said they were treating 30% of their clinical trial patients in Cartitude 4 or whatever follow-on trial they're doing for Carvicti outpatient. They're dosing them outpatient, which I thought was an incredible statistic um, and just shows, you know, when you have a medicine that's incredibly clinically effective but also safe, you can really step down the the level of expertise required to administer these products and to you know follow patients forward and really broaden access that way, um, which is a great step forward in my view. Um, but if the product, to your point, if the product costs five hundred thousand or a million or whatever the number is, they're not going to allow you unfettered access at, at first line or second line. You know they're going to keep you restricted. They're just it just financially it's uh, it's untenable for a lot of these payers to l- allow for first or second line access. To products that are that expensive so cost of goods or cost of manufacturing is a massive issue i agree I mean, we need to get costs under control um but i would argue it's not only for to improve the returns profile it absolutely will do that but i think ultimately these products this is life or death you know jeff used the words commercial viability i think this is the difference between commercially viable being commercially viable or not is if you can't control your cost of goods and you have to charge a high price you're going to be restricted. You're not going to be able to manufacture. You know, the access is just not going to be there. Uh, and so, you know, if you don't address this early, you know, okay, preclinical, that's ideal. But certainly during phase one, you phase one, two, you have to address this issue. If you don't do it, then it's too late. And even with the, the most recent FDA guidance, they said, we want you to address manufacturing issues before you get into the clinic. Now, you know, everyone sort of scratched their head, like, how would we do that? Because today we're, you know, there's the old joke about process development begins when you hit the clinic and you start using, you know, patient cells, uh, which is, you know, closer than reality than any of us would like to admit. But, you know, how do we do that? And I think, you know, we need to, as a supporting, you know, enabling technology industry to supporting therapy developers to make it easy, make it easy for them to access technology, make, you know, make technology that's innovative, that allows them the flexibility they need. Um, and I feel badly for some of these companies that are kind of caught in the middle where they're too far along potentially to stop and say, hey, guys, time out. You know, we need to rethink this process. And they got to go to market with what they've got and what they know probably deep down in their hearts, what they've got is not good enough to make the product widely available. Um, but it's, too, you know, it's too late to sort of go back and start over. Um, but I would suggest, you know, for anyone that's earlier than phase three in their process, which the vast majority of the industry is, it's like 90 percent plus of the companies out there earlier than phase three. Stop what you're doing and think immediately about your CMC and about your manufacturing and how to get to market at scale. Because, you know, we're seeing, you know, Autolis is coming to should get an approval next year. Iovance, I think one of the an adapt immune to two of the first till therapies, both addressing, well, at least one of them addressing solid tumors and, and melanoma. Um, they're gonna it's it's trouble. Those are large indications. They're challenging processes, and they're going to have trouble, I think, with the manufacturing, both getting enough volume out the door to treat any any kind of large proportion of the patient population, uh, but also they're going to struggle with high cost of goods. I think it's just, you know, we just kind of know that's going to be the case, unfortunately. There's a multi-step process almost, right? It, 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 you know, for those medium to late stage assets, it's really de-risking showing, showing that we can have the clinical effect that we think that we have and it's safe and and, and the like. And then there could be a, a re-examination of the process of how can we make this better? How can we reduce the cogs? The the downside of that is, well, depending on your perspective, depending on how much you change, it could fundamentally become a different product, right? Which then could effectively restart your patent and IP clocks, right? And so it's not a um, I guess a zero sum loss necessarily for the sponsor or the, or the biopharma company. It's something that honestly need to look into just to understand, you know, do, does the clock restart or is it, am I just, you know, going to keep going forward and, and we're going to, you know, have, have competitors sooner than we think. Right. So it's a, it's a tough thing. I think the other piece of it is um, there's been a lot on, the clinical benefits and some of these, right? If you look at the the Duchenne's drug from Sarepta, thinking about sur- using surrogate endpoints, but 
are we really going to be able to demonstrate the clinical efficacy that's more increasingly required, especially for these high cost or high price drugs or treatments to be, to be able to get access to patients and get reimbursement? Um, and so how, you know, from a, a, a payer standpoint, you know, what else do we need to show um, in order to get that coverage or from the manufacturing, can we reduce COGS so that way the, the scrutiny isn't as high on, on those clinical endpoints? Do you guys have a view? So I've asked this question of a couple of folks that I know well. No one's ever tried to make, to change fundamentally their manufacturing process once it's been approved commercially. And no one really knows how high the bar is. I mean, everyone thinks it's quite high. I mean, it's you know, the perceived barriers or switching costs are very high. Uh, but I asked some experts, you know, former FDA staff, you know, people that worked in the uh, in in Cber and the kind of cell and gene therapy area, what they thought the how high the bar might be. You know, if someone did want to fundamentally change their manufacturing process in, in various ways, maybe go to an automated platform when they've got a manual process, would that require a uh, a new pivotal trial? And I think universally their answer was no, we don't think so. Um, but I wonder what you guys' view is, and I can fill you in a bit more about what they said they thought it might be. But I'm curious what your perception perception of this is, because it is it's it's uncharted territory, I think, for the industry. I don't know the answer to that either, Jason. I, I would assume at least some sort of bridging study, you know, and obviously bioequivalent. But I, I I think that there's there's fear of not only what it could entail, but there's there's especially if you think about who's trying to make that decision, it's probably somebody who's a franchise lead or a brand lead. Uh, who would who would ultimately have to sign off on that decision? There's there's just perceived risk to the yeah. to the brand that they don't want to take on. I mean, they're owning the PNL for the brand; they don't want to take on all those costs, let alone the brand risk. So yeah. I think I think there's there's beyond the the technical. Hey, could we do this? There's there's some real considerations of of, of should we, if you're uh, you know in charge of piloting that brand to 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 success. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the perception is comparability, parallel comparability study running existing process and new process side by side, running the same CQA release assays, et cetera, at the end to kind of ensure that you've got the same process. And then you have to d- dose, you know, X number of patients, maybe they thought maybe 10 or 20. Um, it wouldn't be a full, you know, full new clinical study, but just to demonstrate again, safety and efficacy, but, you know, having to redo a pivotal and, and undertake a, you know, a three year effort and, you know, tens of millions to do that. It's just, you know, potentially too, too significant a hurdle when there's not, you know, a significant momentum within an organization to do that. But you're seeing more and more. I mean, J and J to use them as an example, they put a public statement and, you know, of their ambition out there. They said, you know, we want to be able to do 10,000 doses a year uh, of, of for Carvicti. You know, we want to be able to treat 10,000 patients a year and in the next five years. And, uh, and my guess is that they're really, examining all their options here and trying to figure out how best to, to achieve that goal. And, you know, we've talked to other companies similarly, you know, with a uh, approved CAR T product that are thinking about not only tens of thousands, but, you know, how do I get to 30 or 50,000? You know, if I'm thinking about first or second line access, or I'm thinking about ex- expanded indications for my product, you know, I need to be, I need to be thinking at that scale. Uh, and they're, they're actively considering these questions because um, ultimately you know, they've realized that they've reached the rate rate limiting kind of step. They're at the, the ceiling of what they can do with their current process and they need to rethink, uh, you know, what they're up to. The way I think about it is if I wanted to draw a parallel, it would be toward uh, not only, I, I think what happens is is you, you have this this first brand, this, you know, first mover in an indication, uh, first in class type therapy, like what we see in today's car T's. what's going to come next won't be you know, what's going to replace it might not just be a anti-CD19 or anti-CD uh, BCMA uh, CAR T therapy, right? It might have a different targeting mechanism. It might be more specific. It will probably come with a different process that's that's hopefully much more uh, efficient and and, uh, and and easier to scale out. So I think I draw a parallel to, you know, in the antibody space, you, you had Humira as a major franchise for, for decades. TNF alpha, now there's better mechanisms of action. They don't have to dose quite as frequently with uh, uh, like Skyrizi being the, the the kind of follow, not, it's not the direct follow on brand, but it's the, it's the evolution of, of uh, the portfolio play in, in, in the uh, immune indications for, for AbbVie. So I think that's, that's probably what it will be for, for our cell and gene therapy developers is there will be a, 
a next generation of products. Maybe it'll target similar indications, but it will be it will be better both from a safety and efficacy standpoint, and and certainly hopefully from a manufacturability and uh, and cogs profile, so that we can successfully treat tens of thousands of patients potentially. It just begs the question, right? So I feel like there's a number of places where we solve something earlier in a value chain and then the bottleneck just shifts later, right? And so, <laughs> yeah. yes, <laughs> the manufacturing that's critical. I think right now, I think today we're thinking that it's going to be, I don't know, six, 7,000 patients are going to be treated within the United States with cell therapies this year. So th- to treat 10,000 patients is a monumental achievement, right? Which we should aspire to. But then the question goes to what we spoke earlier about with Legend, right? That 30% of their patients being treated in outpatient. There's, I don't know how much you can overload UCSF or MD Anderson, right? Where you're going to have, you know, it's not only the, the current, uh, portfolio, you know, the current cell therapies that are being administered. Over the next five, 10 years, you're going to have tens more of these cell therapies being approved. And so you need to figure out how are we going to, to figure out the supply chain and, and patient flows so that way the right patients get the right product at the right time. Um, and, and so there's a whole ecosystem around that that also will need to be unraveled, and, and which is, I, I guess, a good problem to have, right? Is figuring, you know, if you have enough product that is efficacious and safe and we can produce at scale, you know, it's, let's figure out how to do the next steps. Yeah. I think Jeff made a point that I wanted to just go back to, which was, you know, we are in a, some say the golden age of, of biotech and biology or synthetic biology and AI and drug discovery and all these tools are emerging. It will help us you know, discover new targets and treat disease in ways that we haven't even conceived of yet. And this is all happening around us, which is, which is fantastic from a, from a human perspective. From a cell and gene industry perspective, um, I think it's important that we recognize that, you know, this is not the only area of innovation happening. You know, you look at ADCs or antibody drug conjugates and, and these other, these other areas that are really emerging, um, by specifics and they're targeting many of the same indications. They're, they're targeting multiple myeloma. They're targeting other areas that, and if it can be, even if it's not curative, like some of our cell therapies are suggesting they can be, we need to think about, you know, commercial viability in the context of the full range of, of the competitive set. And that's, you know, if you've got an ADC that's going to cost 50 grand and we're trying to charge 450 grand, we're going to struggle. Um, you know, even if we're slightly more efficacious or slightly more safe or, um, and so again, addressing this, you know, we're not special, unfortunately, you know, just because we're in a cell therapy, we can charge, you know, 400 K, uh, versus other products that are, you know, 10% the cost or, or something like that. We need to think about this in, in, in the round, you know, and kind of across the spectrum to make sure that we're, because ultimately what all of us are trying to do is to get patients access to these therapies. That's the reason why we're developing them. That's the reason why we're talking today. Um, and you know, the worst case scenario is, you know, what we saw with Zinteglo in Europe and then and seven or eight other gene therapies that were launched, couldn't quite get the commercial traction, couldn't quite get market access. They'd already spent the money to develop the product. They've already spent the money on the regulatory approval process. They'd already launched the spent the money to launch the product. And patients were anxiously waiting for it and, and wanting to, to get the benefits. Uh, but then the, the economic question couldn't be answered. Uh, and so everyone has to backpedal and backtrack is bad for patients, bad for companies, bad for regulators, bad for health systems. And that's the, that's the worst case is if we don't plan for this early enough, if we don't address the manufacturing and the cost of goods and the, how we're going to get to market and commercial viability from the very beginning, we're driving, you know, we're sort of developing to a dead end. We're never going to get to where we want to get to. We're never going to get to that ROI uh, and to get the kind of patient impact that all of us have been working towards. And I think that's the, that's the worst case scenario. That's the ultimate, you know, worst case is not that actually the product fails in the clinic because that happens all the time. That's part of science. It's part of, you know, working in biology. The worst case scenario is having it succeed in the clinic, but then fail to get market access and to treat new patients. Then investors see that, right? And yeah. and then there's some pretty big headwinds of, well, can we overcome this? And will the next one actually be get commercial traction? So yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and 
again, I think people are starting to be a bit more sophisticated with this and, and be more forward thinking. Um, but it's, it's not everybody. And it's certainly the, the problem we're going to have is the next wave of approvals for the most part are built on legacy, yeah, you first know, generation, I'm gonna say first generation yeah. tech, you know, processes, even if it's mm-hmm. second, but you, you get my point. I so do. yes, it's a challenge. And, and is this a, a, you know, I think part of this, you know, I, I invest in companies as well as operating in one. So I can beat myself with the same, uh, the same self-flagellation mechanism, whatever that is. But do you think investors really get it? You know, cause I think the, the investment community has had a playbook that has worked for 30 years in small molecules and biologics, and it's not working anymore. And human beings are hard to change. Um, you know, the way we think about these things are hard to change. You would think if investors were telling their development teams and there's early stage biotechs, like guys, I understand if it's going to take you another six months to sort your commercial process or your you know manufacturing process out, and we're going to be six months later in the clinic than you said, that's okay. I think it's worth the investment of time now to get that right. I don't see a lot of companies behaving as though their boards and investors are saying those things to them. I would agree. I, I think there's select pockets of them, of companies and, and investors that are, right? It's frankly, it's probably the ones that have been burned by this Maybe. already, yeah. right? And so it's, it's, I think it's a slow growing minority that acts like this. You know, I, I can tell you right now, we're um, advising a client on this exact issue of how do we, how do we think about the manufacturing process? How do we think about our manufacturing strategy to, you know, continue to develop our portfolio of products? And the board is mixed on, or not, at least not hearing their internal manufacturing folks saying, hey, we need to think about this sooner than later. And hence, you know, that's where, you know, we're providing some support and, and really laying out the issues at hand and, and, and providing some of, some of a, a fact base to make a, a, an informed decision about it. Yeah. Well, anyone who listens to this podcast is going to be hired of, tired of hearing me say the, the phrase, but, you know, we are racing to, to create therapies that are approvable, but they're not affordable or accessible. And that, you know, is ultimately where we're going. And a lot of it has to do with investors and boards that are pushing teams to get into the clinic, get first in man as fast as possible. And that old model, you know, I just read an article on this in Cell and Gene, that old, the old model of, of, you know, getting taken out of phase two because you had good clinical data, it's gone. You know, it's just not happening anymore, not in advanced therapies. You know, we need a clear path to commercial viability. We need a clear path to market to deliver an ROI and people are willing to wait. You know, big pharma is willing to wait to see. Are you going to? Do you have a, a credible story of how to get there, or and or can you just plug into potentially our our uh, infrastructure to make a, a synergy that that makes sense? But you know, I, I think that old playbook is it needs to be you know put to the side, and we need to develop a new one for for advanced therapies. I had spoken to the CEO of a company working in autoimmune, you know, and these are big indications. I mean, lupus itself is like, you know, Jeff mentioned is like 50,000 patients a year, you know, maybe 10 X what ALL is currently or five X rather what, what, what ALL is currently. And they're, you know, being pressured by their board to rush into the clinic and get clinical data. That's the milestone everybody wants to see. No one's stopping to ask the question of how are we going to make these things? How are we going to make them available? Um, especially in a big indication like that. And, you know, I think we're we're running against that same old definition of, its, of insanity, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And so we need to, as an industry, I think, you know, really question some of the key assumptions and starts with investors, starts with boards, starts with, you know, leadership teams. Um, and, you know, there are, there are, this is not universal. There are lots of companies that are thinking about this, but, um, you know, you just think there needs to be more of it. There needs to be more people thinking in this way to ensure that those products make it to patients and really have the impact that they could potentially have. I mean, you know, I was reading an article this morning about, you know, this it was a using CAR-T and lupus and they tried it on one patient who had incredible results. I think she was a she, she was still in remission three years later. And they tried it on 14 more patients and all of them are in remission. You know, it's just like, People need these products, but we need to be, uh, you know, having a cure for cancer or rare disease that people can't get access to is useless. 
you know, it's not what we do. What we do. So, um, let me, uh, end the, the podcast today, if you don't mind, but just asking, you know, for, from each of your view, viewpoints, uh, what's your outlook for the sector uh, in 2024? We talked about 2023 being this really kind of pivotal year when we st- started to think about at scale these issues around manufacturing and commercial viability and and, and uh, cost of goods and, all, and really kind of that issue became very, very crystal clear, I think, in, in 2023. Um, maybe, Jeff, I'll start with you and just ask what um, what's your outlook for 24? Uh, maybe the kind of short, you know, one to three year outlook. What's, what does success look like for the industry from your perspective? We just kind of synthesize the challenges that we talked about that I think are going to persist. So the three of those, one is, is, is commercial uptake and commercial ramp still going to be eyes out looking for that next billion dollar asset and selling gene therapy space and continuing to collect that real world evidence and data and build more and more of a convincing case about the safety, efficacy and, and clinical impact on patients of these products. Uh, two is the tension between the recognized need for earlier investment in process in manufacturing in, 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 in how you design the trial and collect the, the data and, and do you surrogate versus outcomes-based markers or endpoints. And then the headwind from the current macroeconomic and, and, and uh, biopharma funding environment, which is, is, is uh, I mean, to contextualize it, we're kind of where we were pre-pandemic in terms of biopharma funding. Uh, uh, it, it had a big kind of peak in early 21, had a six quarter slide, and then it's kind of recovered and been flattish for the last four quarters. Uh, so steady, but not, uh, not, not, not frothy like it was in 2020, 2021. So tension between the need for investment and all these factors that we're talking about with the, the, the economic reality of asking people to wait six more months and redesign the process. They might not have the cash on their runway to do that. And they certainly don't necessarily have the access to raise the capital that they, they would have two years ago. And then the how to build question uh, and, and do you do, do it yourself? Do you partner with the CDMO? Do you, if you're J&J, do you go to Novartis? Uh, so, so how to make uh, are kind of the three big questions that I think the industry will be teasing out and, and working against in 2024. So those are, those are what I've got my eyes out on for the next, uh, next year or two. Interesting to hear what Adam's got on his list. I mean, I agree with Jeff's points. I think one of the things that was something that we talked about a lot on this, uh, you know, for the past hour or so was this decentralization of patient care. And I do think, and this is not going to happen necessarily in 24, but as we move forward into the next three years, even, you see a lot of the big uh, distributors, right? McKesson's, Samarasource Berg, and Cardinal Health that are really listing cell and gene therapy as, as a core tenant of their strategies moving forward. And so how, how can they help shape the landscape of patient care within cell and gene therapy? I, I think is going to be an important consideration for us. You know, it, it, it will require a bit more interplay between the manufacturers, the biopharmas and, you know, the distributors are, of the world, but it's certainly something that again, could certainly improve um, patient access to, to therapies. I mean, it's, it's focused on that affordability and accessibility question. Um, and that's ultimately determined by, as you said, clinicians, patients, payers. You know, if I'm a clinician and I'm going to prescribe a product for my patient, am I going to do the one that I know I can get access to for them and I know I can do it in a timely fashion or one that I might have to wait, might have to, may not be able to get access to? These are these are very relevant. You know, they may not be able to have a manufacturing slot. They may not be able to, to get the product back in time for the patient. You know, twenty five percent of the patients pass away on the waiting list. Um, so these are you know pretty sobering statistics that you know really should focus our attention on solving these these kinds of challenges uh, as a primary focus. Uh, well, on that uh, note, we will end this discussion. And thanks so much to both of you for sharing your insights. It sounds like. 2024 from all um, all perspectives is going to be a busy one for guys like us <laughs> that are trying to help companies solve these problems and to bring these incredible uh, products to patients at scale. So thanks to both of you and look forward to seeing you both again soon. No, thank you, Jason. Yeah, 2024 should be a good year. A uh, lot to do, a lot of work to be done. Yeah, thanks, Jason, again, for the uh, invitation to come chat. Uh, really inspiring conversation. Uh, really helps me think about focusing on the mission, staying grounded and the patients, their families, their needs. We're working toward a really powerful cause here, improving patients' health and their quality of life. And uh, even though things are 
challenging right now. Uh, it's, it's really energizing to, to focus on that and, and all the impact we can have. So thanks again for the great discussion. Absolutely. Thanks, Bo.